Well, um, I suppose the... I'd better start at why I wrote the book. Um, around the 30th anniversary of the fall of D&B and Fu, they put a picture in the, in the newspaper of this man, Zap, sitting at D&B and Fu. He was uh, on a bit of a hillock wearing a uniform, smiling at the camera. And uh, it struck me how strange it was that he was a man who had made such an enormous impact on the West, and nobody knew anything about it, and uh, that it would be a great thing to be able to write a book about him. So that was the seed that was sown um, in 1984. I wrote to the Vietnamese embassy in London and said that I would like to go to Vietnam to meet him and to write a book about him. Uh, it then got pretty bureaucratic. They had to refer it to Hanoi and so on. The man I was dealing with was posted back to Hanoi. The new chap didn't know much about it. The whole thing faded away and I got involved with another book. And I didn't really do anything about it for quite a long time. But then in 1988, uh, I began to think about it again. Um, and in 1989, I approached the Vietnamese embassy again. Um, there was a long delay, nothing much happened. I'd given it up, really. Uh, and then this letter came saying it was uh, appropriate to go to Hanoi in December of that year because uh, it was uh, the 45th anniversary of the founding of the People's Army. Um, and that I could go and write about Zap and about the People's Army. So that's really how it, it started. Um, and then, of course, there was the business of researching, writing, and so on. So to answer your question directly, I mean, there was no feeling in my mind that now was the right time to produce the book. It was events that picked me up and took me along. Um, and therefore, uh, there was no particular timing in the thing. I did hope, though, that um, the events would have faded a bit from people's minds because of the trauma that had been experienced both in France and in, in America. And I think that maybe the book wouldn't have gone at all uh, early on, soon after those events. And I find now, with uh, passage of time, that in fact in France they still feel uh, tremendously uptight about the Indochina War. Uh, and perhaps, and perhaps a bit surprisingly, a little less so in the United States. Yes, oh yes. I saw him in uh, January of 1990. I spent several hours with him, um, spread over a, a number of interviews. Um, I really didn't know what to expect in the sense that um, I had only seen the odd picture of him. Uh, I had read that he was not very well physically and um, also um, I had read that uh, you know he, he was suffering from Parkinson's disease, Hodgkin's disease and all this sort of thing um, and he was quite an old man so I, I really didn't know what to expect in, as a physical presence. Um, the interviews were conducted in what used to be the Prime Minister's residence in, in Hanoi and uh, I arrived there in good time and um, waited for him to appear. Uh, he rolled up in a, in a big black staff car, uh, a Russian Zill, I think they called, uh, with a, a uniformed driver and an aide. Um, and he came up the steps with uh, energy and pumped my hand and was full of beans, full of uh, bonhomie. Um, so I. I there was no problem of, of getting a rapport, if you like. Uh, he wasn't standing off or, or uh, being arrogant in any way. So uh, it made things relatively easy to, to conduct the interview. We spoke, well, I, we had a, a, a woman interpreter, uh, and she was translating English into Vietnamese and back. Who is he? Well, it's, it's a remarkable story. Um, if I can slightly digress here, uh, I think in, in the modern world we live in, there's a great tendency to make people either black or white or um, 
positive or negative and you know very little shading in between and therefore uh, for decades uh, the Vietnamese have been regarded as, as communist baddies if you like and uh, the, the people at the top end of it have been regarded as, as uh, the causes of, of, of all the problems that arose over the years. Personally, I feel, of course, that people are not all good and not all bad, and that uh, there are a mix of things. So to get back to your point, who is he? I think he was a man of, of exceptional intelligence, uh, who showed it at an early age, who did well in his school, um, in a sense got promoted to a better school, uh, and was bright uh, and highly intelligent throughout all, all the, the time that he was growing up perhaps a bit too bright uh, in the sense that he uh, was highly nationalistic um, and anti-colonial, anti the French and that was his chief motivation in the beginning. Um, he was born in 1911 so uh, we're talking uh, about the 30s uh, at the time when he was developing if you like. I think that um, like a lot of people in those times, in, not only uh, in, in the Far East, but all, all over the world, in, in America, in this country, uh, people looked at communism as a means of uh, perhaps sorting out some of the world's problems and, and troubles. Um, I think, of course, time has shown uh, that that was entirely wrong. Uh, the, the, the system is... Uh, proved to be unworkable. But people in those days didn't know that. Um, and I think he, he switched to communism. He read the writings of Ho Chi Minh. Uh, it appealed to him. And I think he switched in his allegiance to communist nationalism, if you like. Yes, I, I would think that that is possibly true. Uh, it's very hard to think of any other general um, certainly living today. I mean, perhaps he's the most successful general of the 20th century. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to go back to, to pick up the thread a, a little bit more about his development, because um, he got highly involved in, in this uh, um, communist theory. Uh, he was expelled from school for subversive activities, anti-French, anti-nationalist activity. Um, he was at, at school in, in Hanoi, but he lived uh, in, in the central part of, of Vietnam. Uh, he was born in, in, the, in the narrow neck uh, of, of Vietnam. But um, he uh, began to write for uh, books and magazines so much so that he, he failed to qualify as a lawyer. He'd taken a degree at Hanoi University in law, but he needed a certificate to practice, and he didn't catch this certificate, so he became a teacher, having married and, and produced a daughter. Um, and he was still working actively uh, in, in a subversive sense. When uh, the Communist Party was, was outlawed in, in France, um, and therefore in the French colonies. He was told that he should um, get away from Hanoi. He went north into China. Um, he, he met Ho Chi Minh, uh, and it, over a period of years he worked um, politically. But at one point in time, Ho Chi Minh told him that he should be the man to lead the military arm, if you like, of, of uh, the Vietnamese Communist Party. So uh, he uh, then uh, began to train handfuls of, of um, men, um, very basic peasant type people from the northern part of Vietnam. So to develop the theme of how he became to be the, perhaps the most successful general of the 20th century, um, out of this tiny beginning, which he started off with what he called an armed propaganda brigade of 34 people, uh, by the time he was finished, he was the commander-in-chief of 800,000. Um, and all through the development of his military life, he, uh, he learnt. He wasn't taught 
um, in a conventional way. He didn't attend a military school. Um, he had read a lot of um, uh, military history. He was very interested in the campaigns of Napoleon. Uh, and so, he, and he used to teach also uh, military history. So he was uh, somebody who, who knew, uh, if you like, the basics, but he was not taught formally. Uh, but he built up from a, a ragtag outfit uh, as, a, as the months and years went by, uh, from a purely guerrilla force uh, through to uh, a conventional force by the time the, the, the French Indochina War was, was well into its uh, first phase, uh, he had gone from smallish company-sized units to full battalions, to regiments, even to divisions. Uh, and armed by the Chinese communists, he had um, created uh, an artillery division um, to support the infantry divisions. So by the time the French really got involved, it was trying to quell this subversion, they were faced with not just uh, um, a bunch of, of people leaping out of the jungle, throwing grenades, firing, disappearing again. They were faced with a proper, uh, well-organized army. And this really was the pattern that he developed. Um, he never at any time uh, had close support aircraft, for example, as, as any modern force would have. And really, um, not until the very end did he have armor in the sense of tanks. Uh, but he had all the other uh, requisites of, of conventional warfare. Um, and of course, uh, his army grew and grew and had to be trained. So they were properly trained. They had proper training camps and so on, and they were turning out officers and NCOs and soldiers. Um, it's what you might call a middle piece high rank, um, a general, yes, the, the, the bottom end of the, of the general rank. I retired in 1978, 32 years, yeah. I served um, in the Middle East uh, and in Europe, and I, I didn't ever go to the Far East. No, uh, not in, in, in the sense of a conventional war. Um, I was, though, involved with the, the British withdrawal from empire, if you like, uh, in the sense that I was um, in, involved with bomb disposal in Cyprus at the time when uh, an organization called AOCA um, was fighting against the British to get us out of Cyprus. Um, and I also was involved in this in the Northern Ireland conflict, which is still ongoing. I live in Bristol in the west of England. Nine. Well, um, I find in life that you sometimes unknowingly come to a fork in the road and, and decide to walk down it. I became interested in the Crusades. Um, and when I was working in the Ministry of Defence, instead of um, reading the newspaper going up and the evening paper coming down and hearing it all again on TV, I started to read books about the Crusade, in particular the Knights Hospitaller because I was particularly uh, intrigued by the fact that here you had the best soldiers of, of that time who were actually monks who took all the vows, were highly disciplined. Out of this, I, I researched this for two years. I then spent two years writing this sort of part-time uh, and got it published. So that was the first book was in fact a historical novel about the Crusades. I then wrote um, uh, a sequence of four books, a quartet of books, taking one character as an, an officer in the British Army, a parachute regiment, uh, and taking him through the Cyprus campaign, Suez intervention, Aden, um, Northern Ireland, and the last book was uh, the Falklands interwoven with um, a sort of flash-forward account of what the Third World War might have been. Uh, Timing-wise, that wasn't all that clever because, of course, it's, it's now history. But in, in a sense, um, it, it, it was valid. It, it, it still could be valid in a slightly different way. No. I think uh, it probably did. I think that a French or an American author uh, might have been considered to be perhaps 
very biased uh, or, or full of received ideas, put it that way. Um, whereas right. a Brit was a, uh, somebody who had stood apart from these conflicts and, and might be less biased. Oh, yes, he's written several books. No, he hasn't. I mean, he's written several sort of communist um, theory books um, setting out, uh, uh, regrettably, in, in rather typically communist jargon, um, particular lines of, of thought. I think it's partly to do with the, the fact that in, in any communist regime, uh, well, they're slightly two-faced about this. They talk about having no personality cult. Uh, but, of course, you had Stalin uh, as a great personality. You had Ho Chi Minh as a great personality, uh, almost deified. Um, but having said that, I mean, the theory is that you, uh, they, they, they rule, they govern in committee. And therefore, uh, yes, a man may be a, a, a high-ranking person within the committee, but in theory he's got no more power than anybody else, and the decisions are taken uh, by the group. So I, I think they have no um, tradition, if you like, of, of writing um, a, a personal account. Um, and certainly, perhaps, it wouldn't be very acceptable for him to do so. Um, when Ho Chi Minh died, they, they, they sanctified him, built this mausoleum, um, created a, a focal point, if you like, for, for the regime. And the men who were with him, uh, particularly as time passed, they grew old, they sort of faded away. I don't think they want another, uh, you know, um, a leader in, the, in that sense. Yes. Um, I, I went to Hanoi with my younger son. Um, we went in a cyclo up to the uh, Ho Chi Minh Museum. We had to get a pass to get in, had to hand in your camera. We then were taken by a soldier to the head of the queue, because there was a great long queue of Vietnamese waiting to pay their respects there. Uh, we went into the, the mausoleum, uh, pink marble, walked up these long shallow stairs, and then you turn sharp right, right again, you're into this room, uh, which is guarded by uniformed soldiers with fixed bayonets standing in the corner. And then the queue of people just shuffles slowly past does a right angle, another right angle. Ho Chi Minh's lying there, looking very yellow, in a sort of yellow light in, in a glass box. Um, and they have a, a slightly lower pathway for the little kids to walk around so that they're not sort of craning around the adults. Huh? And, you know, the whole thing was macabre, um, very strange. Uh, about two and a half weeks only. Oh, it's a lot of people, yes. Yeah. Um, they were very good in, in that sense. They, they wheeled in uh, a lot of people, uh, ex-soldiers, veterans, who had fought both in the Indochina War and in the, um, in the American Vietnam War. And um, they seemed to be free to speak their mind and, and talk very freely. And, and I taped a lot of interviews, and some of them I used in the book. Um, I, th I think that they brought a sort of flavour to it, which was uh, interesting in that it, it showed, perhaps for the first time, their point of view about what was going on. Um, this, this was a possibility, of course. I mean, I, 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 you, you, you touched earlier on, on, on was the fact that I was British uh, 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 instrumental in getting me there. Um, I think the fact that I was an established author was also partly it. And the fact that I had been a soldier was partly it. Um, probably he felt easier talking to somebody who'd been a soldier than to a journalist. But um, I had to declare the fact that I'd been in the British Army. I couldn't, um, you know, just pretend I was a, a person who had no military background. So I think from their point of view, they must have been a bit suspicious of me. Um, you know, why does this guy want to come here and, and, and do this? Uh, similarly, I mean, I was slightly suspicious in the way you've just suggested, in, in that um, maybe they weren't feeding me the right stuff. But I did get the impression, uh, uh, you know, from long life of, of dealing with people, um, 
that there wasn't uh, dissimulation going on. That these, I mean, uh, occasionally they trotted out the party line, uh, but then they'd been living with the party line, were brainwashed and uh, you know automatic all that. But uh, a lot of the time, uh, these these people, a lot of them quite old men, uh, were humorous and, and direct, and you know, I didn't feel that they were setting it up. Um, in, in preparation. Um, I spent, um, one of my postings was in a NATO headquarters which had a lot of American officers in it. And uh, over the years I had always been interested and I spoke to them a lot. And then of course the, the, the key figure uh, was General Westmoreland, whom I interviewed when he came to England. Well, I think um, what I learnt really, um, and it, it wasn't, if you like, directly from him, but he underlined what I had begun to, to feel, and that was that the, the war was fought from the American point of view for the right motivation in the sense of they felt that there was a tremendous threat of communism creeping through the world. They felt they had to do something about it. But having taken that basic decision, I felt that they got, they got in uh, deeper and deeper as time went on and kept digging the pit deeper and deeper. Um, now, from the military point of view, the, the great mistake was that the way to win the war was simply to pile on the hot iron, if you like, more soldiers, more bombs, more aircraft. And they did this despite the fact that clearly it wasn't working. So I think one of the, the big military uh, lesson, if you like, was you have to take a deep breath and, and, and say, well, this is not the way, you know, we've got to do something else. And military action is a form of, as uh, somebody very famous once said, uh, uh, of putting politics into force. Um, so therefore, if your military action is not achieving the political aim, you have to stand back. The other big mistake, politically, uh, and who am I to say, but I mean, this is my feeling, was that personalities uh, began to drive the whole engine. In other words, Lyndon B. Johnson's personal involvement became a matter of pride, and he could not back down, and therefore the American people were taken along on the basis of political pride and the wish to stand again and get re-elected again and so on. Again, he didn't stand back and, and, and say, is this the right thing to do um, in January this year? Um, it, it's slightly disappointing from my point of view because um, a great many servicemen uh, were in Vietnam um, and, you know, we're talking millions, and therefore one would hope that there would be several tens of thousand books sold, but it hasn't gone like that. Did I hope, uh, you know, it may do yet. Yes, he didn't know him. Um, he admired him. Uh, he felt, um, not surprisingly, that, um, that this man must be uh, an amazingly successful general if, to achieve what he did. Uh, he did say that uh, Zapp um, was very profligate with lives. Um, and I think that this is a, a criticism that's been said very often, that Jap um, had no uh, concept of, of sanctity of human life, he used to throw his soldiers in and, and let them get churned up and so on. Um, I think this is a matter of perception. Uh, first of all, it was not long after the Korean War um, in which the Chinese had used the human wave tactics. They were short on equipment and, and technology, therefore mass attacks and, and the whole concept of submerging the enemy with, with, with human beings um, was something which was if you like, accepted in the East. 
So to a certain extent, and, and Jap had um, uh, Chinese military advisors, perhaps the, the human wave tactic, if you like, was um, something that he uh, accepted to begin with. There is another factor too, which is that there's because of this lack of, of, uh, of technology, men with a rifle uh, had, had to balance things off. The French, compared to uh, the Viet Minh, um, you know, were, were extremely well armed. They had an air, air arm to support the ground forces. When the Americans got involved, of course, uh, they were even, uh, you know, ten times more uh, equipment-oriented and technology-oriented than the French were. So, in a sense, the only thing Jap could do was to use manpower, uh, since he, he couldn't, um, didn't have the technology. So what I'm saying is there was a sort of balance here. Yes, he, he had to accept casualties, but um, th this was a way of balancing off the adverse technology. Uh, I would say he's about 5'3". Um, I would say that, uh, obviously, as, as a, a man who until very recently was a member of the Politburo, um, he, he lives a comfortable life. I would say so, yes, yeah. That really was making the point that um, it was war the American way. Um, it really reflects back to what I said a bit earlier on. Uh, I mean, General Westman's point of view was that if he made life as much as possible like life in the United States, the morale of the soldiers would be high. My point is that if you expect soldiers to go into the jungle and live in appalling conditions of heat and mosquitoes and water and torrential downpours and so on and live a, a really hard life, is it actually worse for them, in my view, to come back to be choppered out at five o'clock in the evening when they've done their, their firefight and come back to an air-conditioned canteen full of steaks and, and uh, you know, an iced Coca-Cola. Uh, that's purely my own reaction, that they didn't actually use the large numbers of soldiers who were there to the best uh, possible degree because such a lot of them were involved in producing all these amenities. And considering that soldiers only did a year anyway, uh, I think the right mental attitude should have been, OK, guys, you're out here for one year, you're going to have one hell of a time, uh, but this is how we're going to do it and, and, and fight the war, not to... Uh, and there are other statistics there which, which are quite um, compelling. Um, the number of troops actually deployed in the front line at any given time, searching out the, the Viet Cong or the, the North Vietnamese Army, was a tiny proportion of the total. That's why I put it in there, because I think it, it rather graphically spelt out another uh, aspect of, of this attitude of the way to fight the war. Again, it's, it's a matter of perception. Um, if you, these people must have seen how the Vietnamese live. I mean, the, the Vietnamese uh, is basically a peasant society living on, on absolute basic subsistence. Now, for a, a soldier who has come from a very affluent nation, whether you're talking about the French or, or the Americans or, or anybody else, was taken prisoner by these people, he is going to be suddenly uh, expected to live at, uh, at a, in a way which he, he has no conception of. And I think that's why I say it's a matter of perception. I think that, um, of course, there were times when they were harsh. Of course, people had uh, terrible privations. But I don't think it was laid on specially. I think that the ordinary prisoner in the central prison in Hanoi probably no worse off than the ordinary American GI who has the misfortune to be there. Um, well, it, I, I was really quite amazed because uh, one of the problems in Vietnam, of course, is a huge population explosion. 
uh, the time when we're talking about, you know, in the 70s, you, 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 you talk about a population of about 36 million. It's almost doubled now. And um, uh, so one, the first impression was that Hanoi is incredibly overcrowded. The second was that it didn't seem to have had a lick of paint uh, or, or, you know, uh, an, any real refurbishment um, for 40 years. It was rather like when I crossed over into East Germany when the wall came down. Um, you know, you put the clock back 50 years. Um, and exactly the same in Hanoi. Uh, but, I mean, uh, there were beggars around and so on. Um, there were people um, obviously living at, at, a, at a very low level, but um, generally, um, the people themselves were in a better shape than, than the city. Um, essentially, yes, I think so. I mean, uh, going back to what I said earlier on, the, the um, this business of committee decisions and so on. Uh, but in the sense that he was the driving force throughout, um, uh, you know, the, the, um, the pivotal person, yes, I think so. It was a remarkable achievement, um, and done with very little, to begin with anyway, than, than uh, just human power. Basically what they did was to, when the, the, they created an oven uh, which had um, a bit of a tunnel dug behind it, um, and the smoke was blocked off at the front and was pushed back, if you like, through this tunnel, which had a very small vent. Most of the smoke carbon particles were absorbed into the earth, and therefore they could cook and create uh, hot meals um, without telltale gushings of, of smoke going into the sky. Um, it started off uh, in North Vietnam and then came down through Laos into Cambodia. Um, and it started off, as I explained in, in, in the beginning, with just a small group of people trailblazing, if you like. Um, the next development was to have larger groups of people man-packing stuff. Then gradually they, they, they created a, a harder trail and they could use bicycles. They didn't ride the bicycles, they were heavy-duty things which they adapted but could carry quite a considerable weight of, of stuff slung over the, uh, um, the crossbar. Uh, so it, it then became a trail of hundreds of ant-like people pushing these bikes down this trail. And that grew, became a metal road, and eventually they were running great convoys of stuff. I think they ended up with uh, three laterals, about seven off, off takes into various parts of, of Vietnam. Well, um, I remember talking to an American airman who had spent two tours in Vietnam trying F-111s up and down the, the trail. And um, he would explain to me how he would take off and, and fly cab rank, if you like, up and down just inside the, the border in Vietnam. Uh, and of course, the, the, um, this amazing technology which the Americans had developed enabled them to sensors down, so sensors along the trail, which relayed information, uh, which was then computerized, collated, and sent back to the aircraft actually flying, so that when they're up there, going up and down, flying cab rank, taking a suck every now and again off one of these big tanker aircraft flying above them to keep themselves up in the air, they would suddenly get instructions to zap at a, a particular target. Um, and they would go ahead and do that. But then you have to remember the, the conditions that you're, you're actually trying to hit a, 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 a narrow trail surrounded by jungle and so on. Um, they did hit the trail often, they hit people, but a lot of this, this tonnage was, was scattered around on either side of it. Um, that's a difficult one. I, I think I also in the book I say that uh, they need a, a relatively very small amount of tonnage. I think it was 60 ton a day to keep uh, the, the Viet Cong and the infiltrated North Vietnamese army going. 
Um, I think the answer to your question is that without that trail, they wouldn't have got that 60 tons, and they couldn't have got it in by any other means. So probably, no. No, they wouldn't. But although, you know, the, uh, uh, the American air effort was enormous in the fact that it killed, uh, or, or rather that it, it destroyed uh, a large number of vehicles uh, in the latter days of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, going back to this American friend of mine, who, who I said to, to him, well, were you successful? He said, Peter, we, we, we killed off 10,000 trucks. I said, that's a hell of a lot of trucks. He said, no, Peter, that's nothing. There were 100,000 trucks. So I think that, to me, summed it up in a way. I mean, it, that was the sort of proportion of success. Um, oh, pretty high. I mean, in, in many ways, by, by far, the. Uh, you know, it's given me a um, tremendous uh, um, amount of interest and satisfaction. Uh, but fiction writing, in another way, is, is a different thing. No, I've never seen any evidence. I mean, he obviously has spoken to, uh, uh, to ex-soldiers. Strangely enough, I had a... Um, uh, in response to that book, I had a letter from a man called Allison, who was um, one of the people in the Deer Team, which is mentioned right at the beginning, the American group that went into uh, um, North Vietnam to help the uh, Ho Chi Minh. Um, he, he saw the book uh, and wrote, and he, in his letter, he said that he had actually uh, met that. But, um, and, and obviously he does meet people um, from time to time, but I don't think that facility has been offered of, of not only his interviews with him, but the, the sort of the backup, if you like, from, um, from the military side out there. I went to their staff college, and in fact, she spent Christmas Day, um, which <laughs> will always be a memorable Christmas Day as far as I'm concerned, sitting in this uh, rather broken down barracks on the outskirts of Hanoi, talking to a bunch of Vietnamese generals, uh, eating bananas and, and drinking green tea. No, I, I wouldn't say that. No, it didn't strike me. I mean, I, mean, um, no, I think, think they that. felt they had the moral ascendancy. Well, um, I, I think that in a... I suppose I've never really thought about this, but I think the, the crucial difference was that public opinion to them uh, was a positive factor, and in America it was a negative factor. Uh, and that, maybe, was the real crucial thing in the whole episode. Uh, what I mean by that is that, basically, they are a simple peasant people. They were brought up in the Confucian ethic of obedience. Obedience to older people. Just slightly digress here. When I was leaving Hanoi, they had a little sort of uh, celebration lunch. Um, to which I was invited with my son, and they produced some nice food and some beer and so on. Actually, they asked me to buy the beer, but that's all right. Um, but I stood up, at the, I was asked to say something at the end of it, and I stood up and said, I, I am the oldest man sitting here. And it had an electric effect. They have this, uh, if you like, this um, reverence for older people. Um, I say I'm, I'm digressing, but it was exactly the right thing to say. That you can hear, heard a pin drop. They were not just listening to some foreigner, they were listening to an old man. Um, now, going back to my theory, because they have this Confucian idea of, of, um, of respect for order and, uh, and obedience generally, it was much easier to persuade these simple people that they were fighting a righteous cause. I think uh, the, the impression I have is that, that there was very little doubting in their mind that they were doing the right thing, that the French were interlopers and so were the Americans, they had to get them out. Now, on the contrary side, you have the media, you have a highly sophisticated population, uh, much more difficult to convince, and perhaps without that underlying moral uh, tone, which, which this still exists in, in, in some of these other places. I, I really 
I think only he could tell you that. I think that um, the impression is certainly that it was a development. Uh, what would be very interesting, of course, would be to be able to, to talk, really talk, and get a true answer as to what he feels about communism now, uh, in, in that it has um, ceased to be tenable as a, as a political theory, and that everywhere except in, still in Vietnam to some degree, although the, the barriers are coming down and, and they're beginning to get capitalist and outlook and all that. But North Korea is about the most uh, stringent communist country left in the world, and it's the only one. And uh, you, you um, I mean, even Cuba now is, is, is not what it was in that sense. So that um, y y y you, you seem to, um, he must surely understand that, uh, that, that a lot of what he put his faith in, uh, you know, was a chimera, if you like, it was, it was a fantasy. 1990. Um, yes, but I don't think in, in the sense that you mean, you know, that, that, that he shied away because of um, some political overtone. Um, it could have been. It's difficult to judge that. Particularly, you know, you're not talking directly in the same language and it's all coming through an interpreter. It's a bit difficult. I mean, the things that she shied away at um, when he was talking about the air defence of Hanoi, and I said to him, he, he said, we, we had a, a way of beating the, 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 um, the bombers. And I said, what was that? And he said, oh, I, I, I don't want to talk about it, you know. It was, he was in full spate <laughs> about something else. Um, in fact, what he was talking about was that they would send off one of these surface-to-air missiles, which would then attract all the electronic gadgetry flying in the American air formations, um, but they would follow it up on the same beam, if you like, uh, a few second days with the second one, and the f it was it was a subterfuge. It, it drew away the fire and all the electronic um, missiles and so on, and the second one would hit the target. But that's what he was talking about. He didn't want to answer it because it, it perhaps was a bit of detail. He didn't want to get involved. No, I recorded part of it. My son, uh, we, we borrowed a, or hired a, um, a video camera from them, uh, and my son recorded part of it, but it wasn't officially recorded, no. I don't know. No, um, if you're talking about the Jap interviews particularly, are you? Um, no, I mean, I, I did get... Uh, the feeling that um, he was repeating a lot of what he had thought for a long time, if you see what I mean. It was difficult to to break into his uh, his train of thought. Um, yes, he tended to be very verbose, and of course this makes life difficult when it, when it's being translated anyway, because a poor interpreter is, <laughs> is going crazy trying to keep up and, and so on. So there were difficulties in this. Um, I, I think um, I can't sort of think of any particular thing that, that struck me as being very surprising. But I, uh, some of the interviews with some of the veterans were quite surprising. I mean, like, for example, one of them says, I said to him, did you have malaria? And he looked at me astonished and said, yes, of course, everybody had malaria. 100% we had malaria. And I said, what did you do about it? He said, nothing. You know, I mean, now, th now this again is part of that attitude, isn't it? If you see what I mean, the, 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 the relatively soft West, in contrast to this hard, basic peasant Eastern attitude. I said, but you must have been very ill. Oh, you, you were ill. You had to lie down for three days, then you got up and got on with. It. Now that I think that was surprising to me. You know, um, it played a bigger role, of course, in the American consciousness than it did in the Vietnamese. Um, in a sense, uh, it was another day in being Phu, and, and from Lyndon B. Johnson downwards, everybody was keyed up to the fact that there must not be another day in being Phu. Uh, Dien Bien Phu was the coup de grace, if you like, of, of the Indochina War. Uh, Giap managed to lay siege to a French um, fortress which had been built astride the road into Laos 
Um, he managed to produce 55,000 soldiers, plus a large number of guns and all the ammunition that was needed for these guns, and surround this place. Uh, and it was one of the classic battles of history. He eventually uh, ground them down uh, and eliminated the, the French garrison at Dien Bien Phu, which consisted mostly of paratroopers and legionnaires, the cream of the French army. For the French, it was a traumatic defeat, uh, 1954. Uh, it just happened that the day he took, 7th of May, uh, 1954, a conference opened uh, in Geneva to discuss, amongst other things, the future of, of Indochina. The French ha had the ground cut away from them. They had no way they could go back. Uh, they just pulled out. He's a portrait painter. Um, he's 33 years old. Or not at all, except, well, uh, tremendous moral support. He's a great chap, full of humour. Uh, Vietnamese loved him, uh, all laughing all the time and so on. He was tremendous from that point of view. He took notes for me, but in the actual writing, no. Um, no, no, I didn't. Yes, I have. No. <laughs> uh, I always used to say, Vo Nguyen and up, but they say, Von Nguyen's up. Yes, like a T, yeah. Mm. Yes, militarily, yes. Yes, they did. I mean, uh, there's no question about it, and General Westmoreland is, is absolutely clear that the, the, the casualties inflicted on, on the Viet Cong uh, were enormous. And there's no doubt of this. Um, uh, one Vietnamese general called Tran Van Tra, who says, uh, who wrote later, that um, they were completely decimated. That's a wrong word. It means uh, to kill off one-tenth. There was much more than a tenth that went. Um, they, 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 they never really recovered from that until uh, Jap was in a position to, to launch a, a full-fledged military assault. Um, so military, yes, uh, no question about it. Psychologically, it, it was almost a death knell. I, I would say uh, energy. Uh, he must have been a man of enormous uh, determination, energy. He was a strategist. Um, he was an all-round, uh, very clever military man. I mean, logistically, um, as I've just touched on in this business of DMB and Fu, the problems of shifting these tonnages with guys pushing bicycles and, and man-packing stuff were absolutely gigantic. To actually inspire people to do this must have been a, a, a tremendous achievement. Yes, I, I was very surprised to hear General Westman tell me that he had not studied the Indochina War, um, because uh, apparently not. Uh, um, I liked him, uh, I admired him, um, you know, I don't want to say anything which is hurtful to him, but it did surprise me that he had not studied this, because after all, he was fighting the same people and the same general, and they had fought the French for nine years. So it I asked him, actually, if they had studied it at, at Fort Leavenworth or at the War College, and they hadn't. Um, so, uh, I think perhaps that was a mistake. <laughs> or oh, Lyndon Johnson, I think. I mean, Kennedy uh, started with Eisenhower and the domino theory. Kennedy picked up that baton and, and ran with it. Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson was, was committed already when he got there, but as I said right at the beginning, perhaps a standoff and a bit of thought. And taking advice of people, you see, long, for a long time, uh, it was thought that the Vietnamese were acting on behalf of a sort of proxy for the Chinese. History teaches you that the Vietnamese loathe the Chinese, always have done for a thousand years. Um, it was very unlikely that they were going to spill their blood in order to hand the whole thing over to communist China. Uh, the, it, it was a tragedy in, in, in every sense um, for everybody involved, for the Vietnamese, for the French, for the Americans. Um, appalling waste of, of life um, and the money and resources that were, were sunk in the whole thing. I think the, the, the lessons are that it is very easy to whip up sentiment. The media uh, for want of something to say, we'll, we'll pick up a, a ball and run with it. 
Uh, and the people, because this is human nature, you sit there and you watch the screen and you believe what you read, and what, what you're looking at, and pick what you read in the paper. Uh, in both cases, you, you, you know, the, the French and the Americans, you had this um, tremendous surge of, of, of feeling that, that, that you had a great enemy here that had to be killed off. Um, I believe that, uh, well, you know, the domino theory has been shown not to be correct, that, that the Asia has not fallen to the communists. I was in, in Kuala Lumpur a month ago, uh, a thriving uh, modern country, modern city in a, in a modern country. There's nothing communist about that. They're totally capitalist and, and, and love it. Uh, and yet that was part of the theory that you were fighting to prevent Burma, Malaya and all those falling to communism. My pleasure. Thank you.